Hello, and welcome to the Health, Fitness, and Success Podcast, Episode 7. Please respond. And now I'm recording. You see, it's fairly important to press the record button, because then you don't waste two hours of your fucking life. Um, <laughs> welcome to episode 7 of the Health, Fitness and Success podcast, now in full recorded glory. I'm Mark. And I'm Ben. Hello, welcome. Uh, we're just going to kick off with the news section, which you would have heard last Wednesday when we recorded it, but or when I didn't record it. Um, so we're just going to, we're just going to kick off with the first uh, topic. Yeah, and uh, I think that might have been the best podcast we ever did, so, you know, yeah, you'll never hear that. Not entirely sure of the quality of that podcast. But you won't know that. That could have been no, an amazing No one will ever know. It could have been it could have been the best podcast of all time, but no one will ever know. <laughs> um, so we're starting off um, an article I saw a little while back in the Daily Mail, you know, the bastion of journalistic integrity and accurate reporting. Um, so the, the headline of this article is, you'll never lose weight going to the gym and exercise doesn't boost your mood. Leading expert bust, busts common fitness myths. And this is referring to Dr. Michael Mosley, who was on uh, ITV's This Morning, which is another stalwart of um, uh, early morning TV in the UK. Um, so another great source of accurate information, facts and so on. Um, anyway, he, he made some good points, and this is somewhat distorted in the article. Um, now, just in the interest of full disclosure, Dr. Michael Mosley is behind the 5-2 diet, which is a fasting diet. So he does have a vested interest in saying that diet is important, you know, despite the fact that he's obviously a medical doctor and, and uh, diet is important uh, for a number of different things. But uh, just to get that out of the way, what he was saying here was um, that uh, you can't just go to the gym and do exercise and expect to lose weight uh, without doing any sort of dietary intervention. So um, not everyone gets fitted with exercise. Um, exercise doesn't make you feel better. And going to the gym can make you fat. This is one of the uh, sub-headlines here. Um, just to elaborate on that, what he's saying is that people tend to reward themselves after exercise. Um, so they'll say, okay, I've been to the gym, I've burned this many calories off, now I can have that treat that they wouldn't normally have eaten. Um, and so he's really just saying that, uh, you know, all the evidence backs this up, really, that diet and exercise is more effective than exercise alone as an intervention. Um, And that's very reasonable. Um, Some of the other things he's talking about, like um, exercise doesn't make you feel good um, because endorphins can't pass through the blood-brain barriers. is all very sensible. And, And one of the key things he's sort of identified there, which I do agree with and is worth mentioning is that exercise um, relieving the symptoms of depression is, a, is something that gets banded about a lot, um, but it's not really very accurate because if you look at the research that's done on exercise and depression, it's, it's done on people who aren't clinically depressed, so people who aren't suffering from um, psychomotor retardation, who, you know, the, the sort of people basically who can get out of bed in the morning, can make themselves do voluntary exercise and people with severe depression typically can't do that. So that's a very valid point and worth, um, worth stressing. Um, so Mark, did you, what, what did you think of the article? Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and be a negative Nancy here. Um, so the going to the gym can make you fat. No overeating makes you fat. It's just <laughs> use it as an excuse to overeat. So that's bollocks. Um, Again, calories in, calories out, can't argue with that. Simple math. And reality, um, not everyone gets fitter with exercise. This was the one that pissed me off last time um, when we didn't record the show. There are there was an experiment which followed 100 people who exercised for 30 minutes, five days a week. Over time, their metabolic fitness, their strength in their heart and lungs were measured. While well, 20% became slightly fitter, most didn't change that much, and 20% saw no change at all. They didn't have the right genes. Um, that's a fairly... <laughs> Broad thing. 30 yeah. minutes of exercise could entail the hardest 30 minutes of exercise you've ever done in your life or 30 minutes of walking, both of which yep. will have different outcomes. I've yet to see someone exercise themselves within a, a stressor level and not get a response. 
Yeah. I've yet to see someone break the laws of physiology. Um, exercise does not release feel good endorphins. Yeah, you kind of talked on that better than I could. Forget slogging it out for an hour. You can make a difference in a few minutes. In fact, evidence is increasingly showing a short burst of high intensity exercise are much more beneficial, he said. Yeah, very debatable. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends. If you were talking about something like diabetes, for instance, and you were talking about doing sprints or you know interval training, there would be some evidence to support that. But like you're saying, yeah, but um, versus what, like exactly, you yeah, do what's, six what's seconds of high intensity interval, interval training, get a stress response versus thirty minutes of thirty percent fuel to max and not get any stress response. Well, what if you did thirty yeah. minutes worth of high intensity interval training? Yeah. More volume <laughs> would indicate you get better uh, fitness results. Uh, it's nowhere near as clear cut as people make it out to be. Um, but yeah, but aside from that, yeah, fairly reasonable. Um, but then, you know, the daily fail wouldn't be anything without the comments, so. <laughs> God bless them. On. So you want to do one? I'll, I'll pick yeah. as you go. God bless them and all who fail in her. <laughs> um, yeah, so Gareth from Soham said, guess the cycling and watching my diet that has led me to lose two stone in the last two months is all imaginary then and not really happening. So, Gareth, you've misunderstood the point of the article there. Um, you haven't read it, so I think it's time for you to go home. You're drunk. Tim from Birmingham says, Wrong! You will lose weight if you walk there. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> walk, walk where? I bet over there. <laughs> the next relation marks. Oh, God. Oh, I, I don't know where to walk. <laughs> <laughs> it's there, buddy. Oh, dear. This is a tea bear who has a, an avatar of a, a bear with a what appears to be some sort of hat on um, <laughs> from Congleton says this is absolute rubbish I've lost five stones since February going to the gym not doing cardio but strengthening and flexibility training that's a, all one sentence uh, with short bursts of cardio at the end doing natural body movements like rolling a truck tyre which of course is everyone's favourite natural, so natural body movement and, uh, throwing medicine, object of the tire. <laughs> and throwing medicine balls I've got an amazing PT, well that's questionable, who's got me eating more than when I diet, because uh, you know, obviously when you want to lose weight, what you have to do is eat more calories. Indeed. Um, my life is so much better, and I only wish I could inspire someone to take it up. Well, I think you're in the wrong forum for that uh, on the Daily Mail comments section. Bull Rizadim from Cheltenham. You have to say whatever sells your products and ideas, dot 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 dot. I also have the choice of believing. He is wrong! <laughs> <laughs> oh great well yeah we salute you daily mail <laughs> um yeah so so moving on swiftly moving on from the daily mail um yeah the gluten thing we sort of touched on before so um just to go through this article it's about it's about the um the idea that gluten sensitivity may not exist. So the title of this article, for those of you who haven't seen it already, is researchers who provided key evidence for gluten sensitivity have now thoroughly shown that it doesn't exist. OK, so um, the TLDR summary of all of this is basically that these guys did some research that um, pointed to the existence of gluten sensitivity in, in, in non-celiacs. So people who don't have celiac disease, um, they make up about one percent to two percent of the population as a rule of thumb. Um, now, they went back and revisited that research and, um, and their data. So they did some follow up papers and they did some tests on uh, some more self-identified gluten sensitive patients. So in other words, people who uh, believe that they have gluten sensitivity. Um, and they found that there wasn't really any evidence for gluten being the culprit as such. So in other words, whatever was going on, with the subjects, whatever was causing the symptoms, um, which has been labeled gluten sensitivity, was due to something more complicated. Now, that could have been uh, what you'd call FODMAPs, um, which, uh, you know, so that you can look at the FODMAP diet and basically FODMAPs are a kind of um, carbohydrate um, and they can be poorly absorbed in the, uh, I think it's small intestine, and that can cause issues in people, uh, you know, with digestion. Now, so it could be FODMAP. So it could actually be the gluten. We don't know. Uh, or it could just be a, a nocebo effect. So in other words, people believe that when they feel lethargic and um, low on energy or their digestion is poor for whatever reason, you know, maybe they feel bloated, they identify that with the gluten. And so they 
decide that they're gluten sensitive and so on. Um, so it's a nocebo effect, you know, or, or, or maybe your auntie says, oh, I've done a gluten free diet. I felt so much better. So you remove gluten from your diet and you think you feel better as a result. So there's all sorts of complicated stuff going in there. And basically all that's happening here with this research is is that it's not as simple as saying gluten is evil. Uh, you need to cut gluten out. There's something more complicated going on. And the likelihood is that you probably don't have an issue with gluten if you're in the general population and you're not a celiac. Beautiful. Um, yeah, so like last, like I just want to point out some of the numbers here um, about the business side of this thing, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is probably more uh, Bit- elucidating. Business. There's some real business numbers. Um, sales of gluten-free products are estimated to hit 15 billion by 2016. And that's pretty big business. I think you'd agree. Um, although experts estimate that only 1% of Americans, like you uh, pointed out, about 3 million people suffer from celiac disease, 18% of adults now buy gluten, gluten-free foods. Yep. So that's in no <laughs> way uh, influenced by advertising by the people that sell these products. Yeah, and it, what it demonstrates is a kind of lack of self-awareness because typically you'll find that the people on the gluten-free sort of paleo elimination diet bandwagon are the first to tell you that the um, you know big business is there to promote the standard uh, food pyramid, um, you know, the eat well plate, uh, you know, which is the UK um sort of you know dietary recommendation um uh, they're there to you know they're shills for you know uh, nestle and all the other companies trying to sell you sugary uh products low in fat they're the ones killing you meanwhile the the massive the massive gluten-free industry is your buddy they're there to help you um and yeah so it's it's fascinating that there's a lack of kind of um symmetry there in the thinking but uh yeah it's 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 well worth pointing out that. I'm just doing a little bit of science here. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm converting $16 billion into Great British Pounds and seeing how many Domino's pizzas I can buy for that money. Okay. And then that way we'll see. What, what sort of pizzas are we talking here? Well, I'm thinking, uh, comic okay. creator, I, I, like, I like Domino's. Yeah. I'm going to go. And I'm a particular fan of the uh, the New Yorker. Okay, that's controversial, but I go oh, with that, yeah. Is it? Or what, 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 what are you liking? What are you feeling? Uh, I don't know. It's been a while since I've ordered from Domino's. Maybe there's some new stuff on the... Uh, they, they don't change the entire game. Mm. It's all changed. Well, like, usually like the Texas barbecue is, you know, pretty uh, solid. Uh, that's controversial. Uh, well, it's just barbecue sauce. I mean, come on, bro. I, I like barbecue sauce. Well, I like barbecue sauce too, but not, not, not in the pizza setting, though. I mean... Okay. You, you can't be having barbecue sauce for your pizza. So, it's just fucked up. So if I bought an ordinary pizza and I put my barbecue sauce on it, what would you what would you say about that? I, I, I think I would, I've done that. But it would have to stop talking, I think. That would literally just have to stop <laughs> talking then there. Okay. That, that, that shit's not cool, man. Um, oh, it's awkward now. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually why the last podcast didn't work out. We were still <laughs> talking about pizza. I actually uh, threatened to come around to his uh, house <laughs> with a shotgun. Um which we're legally allowed to have in the UK. Um, yeah, so you could buy... <laughs> Swiftly moving on. Um, that's a lot of zeros. Let's see. Three, uh, yeah, you buy 56, 56 million, um, 698,061 Domino's pizzas, large Domino's pizzas of your... Um, and then feed it to all of the non-celiac gluten-free people. In the UK. Nice. So for every... For force feed them, of course. Oh, of course. Uh, 65 million. That's, of course, the population of the whole UK. Not if sculling it their way. Two, three, two, three. That's... Uh, oh, wait. I've done that math wrong. Anyway, I, I think we'll move swiftly on from this tangent, because it's not really doing anything for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really informing anyone. No, not uh, really. Yeah, so the, the next one up is... Um, a study called Long-Term Effects of Inhaled Nicotine. So <clears throat> this study was done um, on rats. So uh, if you're waiting for a long-term study on humans, you're going to be sorely disappointed because what they did was they, <laughs> they put the rats in a chamber with nicotine at a concentration which 
gave uh, about twice the plasma concentration of nicotine found in heavy smokers. That was for 20 hours a day, five days a week, um, over a two-year period. So, you know, that's not going to happen with a human study, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and what they were trying to examine was the um, effects on, you know, the increased risk of um, CBD, um, cancer, uh, particularly in the lungs, and, and really to isolate whether or not it's nicotine that's the cause. Um, so what they found was after they ran this um, study for two years, um, they couldn't find any increase in mortality, uh, and, you know, any increase in frequency of tumor, uh, tumors confer, compared with the controls. Uh, it's not a tumor. Um, and there were no like oh, microscopic... No. <laughs> there were no microscopic or microscopic lung tumors. You know, any, basically, they couldn't find anything which was indicating that nicotine was, you know, the cause of this um, uh, disease that you associate with tobacco smoking. So, when you have nicotine in its pure form in inhalation, um, the conclusion would be that uh, it's relatively safe. Um, so, this does throw some questions out about, um, you know, tobacco smoking, obviously, and e-cigarettes, which we talked about before. Be rich, murdered, and mutilated her. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just looking at the average lifespan of uh, a rat, which is two to three years. So this is the equivalent of being put in a chamber for 20 hours a day for your entire lifespan, five days a week. Yeah. And um, inhale nicotine. Nicotine. It's, it's, <laughs> you know, it's fairly um, and with no no adverse effects. Living the dream. So if you're if you're a smoker right now, you call you jelly. 420 smoke nicotine every day. <laughs> Sponsored by Doritos. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think it's it's good, like a, obviously it's a rat study. Blah blah blah. Usual crap applies. Um, yeah, I think it, it's uh, evidence in favor of what we said last week, which we didn't record again. Um, was that if it helps people get off smoking, which we know has all of these negative health effects. Not only for the person doing it, but more importantly for people surrounding them, and then more more power to e-cigarettes of people who want to buy them. Yeah, yeah, and if there's uh, if we can do more research on them, really establish, you know, they are safe. That would be that be ideal. But like you say, anything that gets people out of the habit of smoking tobacco, um, and anything which weans someone off that is, uh, in my view, a positive thing. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Um, and next up was a really, really good um, meta-analysis um, titled The Effectiveness of Exercise Interventions to Prevent Sports Injuries, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Randomized Controlled Trials. So um, obviously, if you're familiar with um, study methodology and uh, the study design, you'll know that uh, RCTs, Randomized Controlled Trials, are... That gold you know, standard. That, that gold standard, exactly. Ben that, Goldacre. That bomb ass shit. <laughs> the ben Goldacre standard. Um, ben Goldacre, and, please. <laughs> and uh, and the meta analysis basically takes um, a whole bunch of studies, has an inclusion criteria, an exclusion criteria. So, in other words, what studies are we going to consider? What ones are we going to check out? They do an analysis, usually statistical. Uh, on those studies to try and pick out what's happening. Um, so you can usually trust the meta-analysis to give you a, a, a broad overview of what works in terms of supplementation, you know, in, interventions, clinical interventions. Uh, in this case, we're talking about um, uh, sports injuries, and so stuff like stretching um, and uh, physio. Um, and what they found in this study was that um, really, in terms of stretching, that strength training, uh, the conclusion here was strength training reduced sports injuries to less than one third and overuse injuries could be almost half with most of the, uh, <laughs> with the, uh, methods used apart from stretching. Um, so, so that was really interesting to see. And it's kind of chimes with what we've learned about stretching, uh, over the last few years anyway. Yeah. So I'll turn off, go off on a, 40 minute diatribe the last time but the <laughs> they looked at 25 trials um, they included 26,610 participants which obviously anyone who's ever dealt with sports science literature will appreciate that's a lot more than you normally get you normally get 10 college students um, in total there were 3,464 kinds of injuries analyzed um, and they, they looked at 
obviously you're saying stretching, um, multiple exposures. So that'll be physiotherapy, looking at somebody, proprioception training, so that's like balance work, BOSU ball, stability ball, um, one armed activities like um, pistol squats, and modified press ups for shoulder injuries, things like that, um, and strength training. And they all showed a tendency towards increasing effect with more exposure. Both acute injuries and overuse injuries can be reduced by physical activity programs. Um, and like Ben was saying, strength training has been um, kind of singled out as the most effective methodology. Um, and that, as I said, a third of overuse injuries and almost half the incidences of acute injuries. Um, it's quite interesting. I mean, if you know anything, like what we know about stretching from literature is any kind of um, static stretching reduces um, acute power output reduces acute strength, acute strength, reduces um, acute power activities, um, and also it doesn't actually, the kind of method, like the actual mechanism that we thought prior, uh, it actually increased the length of muscle, muscle, muscle skeletal tendinous, tendinous unit, it doesn't actually do that. Um, actually, well, you kind of linked me a study before, Ben, that was kind of talking about that. Can you uh, yeah, yeah. remember off the top of your head what the, the, the inferred mechanism was? Um, I believe it was to do with kind of neural inhibition. So they were basically saying that, um, you know, when, you, when you're stretching a muscle, you can't meaningfully change the length. You know, you can't mechanically, um, you, maybe let's say 5% or something like that, maybe 10% maximum you could perhaps stretch it. So, you know, typically when people talk about having like tight muscles or shortened muscles due to sitting down like at a desk, let's say you're talking about hip flexors, um, the muscles aren't really shortening significantly. So the idea was that it's really CNS inhibition. So in other words, um, your your brain is basically, you know, saying, oh, I don't really I don't really know what you're trying to do with this movement here. Um, I'm going to lock this down. I'm not going to let you um, stretch anymore. So you get that discomfort associated with stretching. Um, so when you do stretching over time, the flexibility that you get isn't so much from any sort of mechanical, you know, you're not changing the tissue length. You're not, you're not doing anything to the, the actual muscle itself. Really. You're just building up a kind of graded exposure to the discomfort of, of going through the stretch. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that, that'll affect the action of the muscle spindles when the yeah. muscle belly that, that detect changes of length and can inhibit uh, yeah. traction. Yeah, exactly. It's one of the major um, adaptations to strength training and more so plyometrics training is um, the changing of the... So, like, people talk about, like, a stiff ankle in, like, um, track and field, especially in something like um, high jump or, um, to a less extent, probably hurdle jumping. Um, that's because the training produces that stiff ankle that can produce um, force a lot faster than someone else. So, like someone like a weightlifter or a powerlifter wanted to do a depth jump, they'd have to like go into a squat position or a semi-squat position to absorb the load, and then break the eccentric train with concentric strength to um, to produce the upward force they're looking for. Whereas a good um, like high jumper will be able to keep a fairly stiff knee ankle joint, fairly stiff knee joint, stiff hip joint, and just pretty much use their um, tendons. And their joints and gravity to produce that force quickly. Um, so there's a really good video if you ever get a chance to watch um, of Stefan Holmes, who's um, I think he's a Swedish high jumper doing hurdles. Uh, it's crazy. The guy barely bends his knee and he he, he jumps over like a meter sixty hurdles, um, like effortlessly. Like it kind of like Stefan, please. Yeah, it's like a, it's, but it's like a extreme example of someone doing it, and it's not a muscular guy. It's a, it's a so it looks like a marathon runner, but a spring marathon runner. Um, but yeah, it's really good to see. Um, and plus the full papers here, so I'll I'll link all the studies and stuff in the in the description on YouTube and on the website. Um, really good to see a meta analysis done on this sort of thing, and people always think that feeling stiff or you need to kind of warm up by stretching before a workout which is something that you could probably um, question reasonably heavenly um, because mobility and um, flexibility tend to be more kind of movement pattern based than they are 
um, stretch plays. I was still talking about length with this last time, um, where the kind of the tendency in physiotherapy now is to move towards more kind of a functional screening or screening of what some physios are beginning to call um, the meaningful task. So if someone does a traditional sort of hamstring um, screen where they might keep a straight leg and someone might push their leg up and they take the uh, joint angle at the hip with a straight leg as an indicator of how flexible that hamstring is, um, would that someone who might pass that test beautifully might still exhibit um, hip tuck in a squatting pattern, and that could be down to skill learning, it could be down to like tightness in a joint, it could be down to lack of strength somewhere. It, it's a very very complex problem that can't be adjusted. Uh, it's not, we're not it's not so easy as saying, oh your glutes are weak, so that's why you do this here, or you're tight here, so that's why you do this. Um, it's never that simple. Um, yeah, you see a lot of traditional um, physios or, or PTs still wheeling out that whole methodology, you know, looking at someone's squat and saying, oh, you know, you're, you're weak in this muscle, uh, you know, and I've diagnosed it by doing these sort of static uh, range of motion tests. And it's kind of like, I, well, we ended up talking about this last time, but, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's kind of outdated, that whole way of looking at things. Um I think it's more meaningful paradigm to then look at the task in situ. So if I, example, as of a weightlifter who might exhibit um, tuck in a bodyweight squat, well, if you, load up, if you load them up with 180 kilos, the tuck might disappear. So functionally, that person's good to go for that task. Whereas if you only looked at them with a bodyweight squat, you might think, well, you're at risk of injury yeah. because you're getting this spinal flexion through the movement. Not necessarily yeah. the case. Yeah, exactly, and it's funny because you see a lot of PTs try and regress people when they, you know, when they actually test that without actually ever just seeing if someone can get under a bar and actually do a, a full back squat. Yeah. You know, it takes them months to even get to that stage when they could have just started off there. And I, I found uh, pull squats, which uh, you know you kind of introduced me to, really, um, really, really useful for building um, additional flexibility and, and improving the depth in the squat. Just doing lighter paused work um, really brought up um, my cl- one of my clients' squat uh, uh, squats uh, in particular. She um, she made some huge progress in in three months just working on a sort of conjugate system where we do you know full uh, squats with no pause and then full squats with a pause, working on increasing the range of motion. It really really improved her flexibility without having to do anything else. Um, outside of that, really. Yeah, what you'll find with things like this, and something I'm starting to explore a lot more, is um, there's a, a guy from Holland who's a biomechanist called Franz Bosch, and he's a huge advocate of um, what's known as dynamic systems theory. It's basically, it's a counter hypothesis to skill learning. Then You'll typically hear um, things like motor patterns used and when people talk about this sort of thing, um, but if you actually look at the amount of motor patterns per se that would need to be stored in the brain for human movement, uh, it'd be physically impossible to store that amount of information in the hardware we have. So people are kind of moving away from that way of thinking towards this dynamic systems model, which basically says a lot of skill learning and a lot of things are environmental based. Um, a lot of the learning happens locally within the muscle tendon or within the muscle spindles or within, the, within the motor units within the muscle. Um, something I need to read up a lot more on, but one of the kind of the biggest uh, outcomes of this is when you're coaching that if you make something, you make practice varied and, and object, an objective. So the example of weightlifting, if you went from say box squat, front squat, pause squat, full squat, overhead squat, and you were chasing the amount of weight you could lift in those movements over time, that person will develop the ability to move through a full squat with a barbell. Um, probably a lot more efficiently than someone who just went, right, we're going to do a uh, pause squat and I'm going to coach you how to do it. Um, just due to the kind of the multifactorial feedback they're getting, um, you're putting the skill in a different environment, you're putting it like kind of different uh, feedback mechanism, the mechanisms on the uh, on the skill learning process. Uh, it's, well, there's a good... The one study that kind of stuck out in my head when I watched Franz Bosch speaking about two or three years ago um, was they they had two groups of uh, people throwing a baseball and they 
there was two groups. The the group who just threw the ball and tried to throw it further, and the other group had um, coaching from a like a professional coach who I don't know if it was um, in the NBA or whatever the hell they are. Um, the the professional or the the American Basketball Association, whatever the fuck it is. Um, the guys who just threw the ball and tried to throw it further ended up throwing the ball further than the guys who were getting coached by the professional coach because they were just practicing trying to throw it further. Objective based feedback. That was just one of the little, um, uh, one of the little kind of nuggets that kind of make up this whole new way of thinking about coaching. Um, so probably a yeah. bit of a tangent. <laughs> no, it's it's fascinating though because um, I think there is still, like I said, a lot of that um, old school. Um, approach to um, movement and injury and stuff uh, it's very pervasive you know in the whole especially amongst personal trainers who aren't who don't really keep up to date on this stuff um, so I find it fascinating you know hearing your perspective on it um, my, my number one hate is muscular um, weakness or <laughs> session of no, muscular weakness it drives me up the fucking wall I hate it um, I, like West Side are the biggest guys for this like triceps and the bench press as an example, or hamstrings and a deadlift, or no, <laughs> just <no. laughs> please, Louis, please. <laughs> not that simple, uh, but yeah, I'm not. I'm gonna end up going off on a fucking rant or go on anymore with this. Right, so, so let's uh, so let's move let's, on. Uh, yeah, move on and to steroids, CrossFit, and the CrossFit Games. Who and how? This is not cool. Um, please, glass was- man, don't sue me. Yeah, this is posted by John Romano. We are looking at um, effectively yeah. a sc- screenshot of yeah. this because I don't think the article's live anymore. Am I right? Yeah, you're right. It's been taken down. So again, just please don't sue us. Um, we don't have any money, uh, and you know, we, we need we need this. We need this. <laughs> Once again, proving that you can control content on the internet as soon as it goes on the internet. <laughs> um, yeah, so, definitely not looking at it right now. Yeah, exactly. The, this is uh, this is legal action at its finest. Um, so yeah, censorship it works. Um, so yeah, the article is basically um, just give you a broad overview. Um, if you aren't aware of Anthony Roberts, he's uh, what you might call a, a steroid guru. He's been around a long time, especially online. You might have um, you might have heard of. Uh, Dan Duquesne, who was a uh, very, very well-known sort of underground steroid guru who uh, wrote handbooks on the subject uh, before people really had access to information on the internet. And Anthony Roberts kind of followed on from him. Um, <clears throat> so Anthony Roberts, obviously someone who has a huge um, experience base dealing with uh, performance-enhancing drugs and, and helping athletes use those drugs to beat drugs tests. Um, and to, to get results with them. And this article is basically detailing how, how you can approach beating drugs tests, um, how that's relevant to CrossFit and, and their testing that they do, and looking at evidence, or, or I should say circumstantial evidence, that might indicate that uh, CrossFit athletes um, are assisted um, based on their fat-free mass index, which, of course, is not in any way conclusive, but... Um, it does give you some interesting um, food for thought anyway. So, Mark, you, you had a little look through this, didn't you? Yeah, I've read yeah. the entire thing, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, if you want to take through, like, I'm just going to, I'm just reading the who's using bit. Um, oh, okay. If you just yeah. want to do, like, a little chat, and then I'll join the conversation yeah. about what's going on. Yeah, so basically, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, the concept of doping and, you know, how that how that relates to top level athletics um and well you you know you might be living under a rock and you might think that uh, top level athletics for example is is totally clean and that drugs testing has cracked down on on doping but the the reality is that couldn't be further from the truth and it's just that people have continually evolved ways of avoiding drugs tests uh, and, and and beating them um now, of course, it is very, very difficult to do that if you're a top-level athlete because there's a lot of um, random testing throughout the year and um, usually you have like a free strike rule. So 
um, if you don't manage to make it to uh, a test when when you're you're told you need to be there, um, you know you'll you'll get a you'll get a strike against your name, and if that happens repeatedly, um, you unfortunately you're going to receive a ban. Um, so beating drugs tests is you know for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, PEDs is kind of to do with um, making sure that drugs and their metabolites so in other words if you think of the residue of the drugs are clear from your system by the time you take a test and and because you don't necessarily know when the testing is going to happen um, of course it's a bonus if you do but if you don't know when it's going to happen then you have to use fast acting drugs so in other words drugs which have a very short half-life they peak quickly in the blood and then they clear very quickly so there are uh, numerous drugs like that there are also drugs which there haven't been effective tests developed for um, up until recently, human growth hormone was one of them, so they couldn't test for HGH. Um, so what you're looking at is um, a combination of drugs, um, and they're, they're listed here, um, that, that can't necessarily be tested for or, or clear quickly enough that um, you could do a random drugs test and, and, and pass. Um, so that includes growth hormone secretagogues, so peptides which uh, stimulate your own release of growth hormone, um, IGF-1, which is um, hormone related to HGH, uh, it's insulin growth factor 1, and you can think of it as being um, kind of, it, if you think of satellite cells as being destined to maybe turn into a fat or muscle or whatever, IGF-1 kind of um, differentiates cells. So in other words, it tells that cell what it's going to be, and you know, that's one way that can work in muscle tissue. Um, so people usually inject that into the muscle in the actual, what you'd call a slight injection into the muscle to try and um, use that differentiation action. Um, I believe it also has some effects on um, reg, you know, blood glucose, so it's kind of a, a glucose disposal agent as well. Um, anyway, so there's a whole bunch of uh, peptides and, and you can use um, and then the article goes on to talk about you know who does the testing for the CrossFit Games um, and just examining how rigorous that testing is um, because if you really want to make sure that an athlete is clean you need to go through every substance on the WADA uh, band list now they're calling into question whether or not um, the organization, uh, which is called the National Center for Drug-Free Sport, employed by CrossFit, uh, actually does this uh, rigorously. So that's called in the question. Um, and then, of course, they're talking about um, how certain drugs that we've talked about already uh, aren't on the, the official WADA list, so they could still be used without any sort of penalty. Um, and then really the, the, the core of the article in the sense of, you know, <laughs> throwing accusations around, if you like, is that um, they they look at fat-free mass index, uh, which is basically the ratio of um, your fat-free mass in kilograms over your height squared. So it's kind of like BMI, but, uh, but for lean. Swole. Yeah, but for swole, yeah. So the, the claim would be that anyone over 25 on this scale is likely to be uh, using performance-enhancing drugs, or rather... You know, the higher you are on this scale, the less likely it is that you're a natural athlete. Let's put it that way. Um, and this has been based on looking at um, pre-steroid era athletes or what, you know, what you would call pre-steroid era athletes. We don't obviously know whether or not they had access to drugs, but, but basically old school bodybuilders, you know, would be an example. Um, and the idea was the cutoff point of 25 came from looking at that data. So, so examining a list of uh, well-known Across the athletes, you can see that a lot of them are over the 25 mark. So um, you've got Jason Kalipa at 28.5, for instance. And then the argument is that, you know, these guys have a fat free mass index over that sort of cutoff point. So the implication is that they are probably using drugs. Um, so it's not watertight. It's not conclusive by any means. Um, the article's just really food for thought, something to consider. If you think that CrossFit is clean, this is something to perhaps um, consider when you... <laughs> when you, you, when you yeah, yeah. I, could, I could jump in now. Um, so we're talking about looking at Barry Bonds, who pretty much everyone knows is juicy, juicy. Uh, 
And at the height of his um, juiciness, he was a, he had a FFM of 28.2, um, and he was setting all kinds of records um, in baseball. So looking at this, um, the thing for me though, FFMI, sorry, the thing that um, kind of does it for me on this scale is if we're using this as an example, we're comparing them to like baseball or American football or bodybuilders, sports that have little to no aerobic component, um, whereas we're talking about CrossFit, which has nothing but an aerobic component apart from the odd um, event such as like a clean and jerk ladder or a deadlift ladder. Um like endurance is pretty much the CrossFit game, uh, and these guys like well, this guy Jason Killefa has a 28.5, which is higher than Barry Bonds, Um like pretty much all these guys are over 26. And we're saying there's a few guys under like 24.2, um, 24.8. I'd say though if you're coming within even that natural limit um, in a sport that pretty much isn't tested, then eh. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a really nice study here too that shows um, the graph showing that basically when, whenever a new untested drug comes out um, performances get better in the sports so like 100 meters and woman shot put or the graphs here um, and then when the test catches that drug performances get worse yeah, it's funny how that works isn't it uh, interesting but you have uh, correlation, not causation, of course. Obviously uh, not, but um, <laughs> a fairly solid line of uh, rationale there. However, um, yeah, really interesting, really interesting subject. Um, yeah, and of course there was the whole Balco scandal, which was, uh, if you're not familiar with that, the Bay Area Lab um, run by Victor Conte, um, whose job it was, I mean, he was a research chemist. He basically designed drugs that were made to uh, get you through testing. You know, he designed steroids and he designed drugs that couldn't be tested for. So oh, yeah, Basically, the way the test used to work, um, it was spectrometry, so like DECA would give a certain signal on a graph and they would have the, the, that signature and they'd be able to tell what you're on. Whereas you changed the, like, you changed how the testosterone molecule was put together, you could actually beat that test and that's how uh, Barry Jones, or not Barry Jones, who the fuck's Barry Jones? Um, <laughs> Sprinter, drug cheat, tell me, come on, help me out here. Ben Johnson. I said Ben, ben Johnson, Johnson yeah, got yeah, topped. Yeah. He uh, fell out with um, Charles, or Charlie Francis, sorry, um, in the, the summer before the games they were heading towards. Um, left his training camp and went to see his uh, Jamaica doctor for a training camp. And he ended up taking a, he was meant to be taking Stanzadrol, but he ended up taking a, I can't remember, was it Decker? I can't remember. Um, I think he got caught with uh, um, Winstrol. Um, oh, it was, it was Winstrol. I think. I think about, so. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's the other way around. Yeah, sure. he basically ended up taking a drug from which they had the, the test for, so he ended up getting popped. Um, but of course. So sorry know, for his loss. So sorry. Um, but you know the, the other guy completely clean. Uh, what's the American called? Um, which one? The the guy he was like his competitor. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, Carl Carl Lewis. Yeah, who Carl actually, Lewis who got who actually popped for domestic uh, yeah, got popped for amphetamines of all things. Yeah, yeah, of course. But he was clean though. He was clean. Oh, totally uh, clean. Well, only failed the drug test. All American, all American hero, mm-hmm. Carl Lewis. God clean. bless America. Yeah, it's funny how um. How Linford Christie as well uh, went from I think I don't know if he came fifth in that race in Seoul where Ben Johnson broke the world record. Uh, anyway, he didn't place very well. Funny how he went uh, to dominating the hundred meters after that. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, he, breaking. he didn't test positive, of course. No, of course he was clean. And he was clean right until the end of his career where he got caught for I believe it was Nandrolone um, because he and he was using that. And I I think I remember him at the time saying it was because he was getting old and he just wanted to keep up with the younger athletes. So, but of course until that point he'd been clean. Um, of course, so, yeah. So it's a shame what you know old age can do to you. But you turn to drugs. <laughs> it's got to keep up with the kids, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it's really, I mean, for me, top level athletics, it's a given that there is doping involved. Um, if you look at guys, and, and you know, also if you follow athletics, you can see 
that there are guys like Justin Gatlin who, you know, got caught doping, um, guys at the top level, you know, who, who have got a lot of talent and suddenly have a breakthrough moment where they start, you know, breaking records or taking home, um, titles. Uh, Tim Montgomery was a great example of that. He was always a second string sprinter after Maurice Green and then suddenly out of nowhere he was beating everyone. Um, you, you see this happening all the time and I don't think there's any, I don't think there should really be any shame in it in the sense that I, I believe there's something of a, you know, a level playing field at the top level because I don't really think that you can get to the top level without performance enhancing drugs. But, um, but yeah, I guess for a lot of people that's kind of depressing to. Uh, it depends to hear that. on sport. Um, bigger, higher, faster sports always have some kind of doping. That's just the way it is. Like even further sports as well. So, uh, and yeah. did you see that uh, documentary on Lance Armstrong? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Great doc, great documentary. Um, but yeah, and anything that pushes the boundaries of physiological performance will have some kind of doping involved in it somewhere. Um, you can reach the top level without doping in some instances. I know for a fact it's possible to be a um, top 10 IPF powerlifter without drugs. Um, doesn't mean that there isn't drugs in the IPF, because there definitely is. Um, <laughs> but is it possible to win an IPF um, World Championship without drugs? I'd say so. Um, Dean Barnes, UK lifter, who I believe to be drug-free, who's won the IPF World Championships. Um like he's not doing anything that's like defies what I would believe within my sport anyway, of being possible and drug free. Um, certainly weightlifting's another case entirely. Being uh, an, an Olympic level or an Olympic sport, the, the standards in that sport are much higher. Yeah. Of so th- there's higher levels of participation, and um, there's professional programs, and there's professional doping programs. So yeah. And I- Sorry, go ahead. I think we've got. To, I think we've got to remember as well that when we talk about doping, we we kind of get stuck in the idea of um, you know bodybuilding style drug use, where you know it's huge amount, you know, grams of testosterone every week. But a lot of it is simply, you know, it might be low dose um, steroid use. Yeah, for instance, that's why weightlifting and... is low dose. <laughs> no, no, maybe not weightlifting, but. Uh... <laughs> But uh, yeah, just just using compounds more for recovery, so you can sustain the level of training rather than for hypertrophy uh, would be. Uh, that's the main mechanism in sport is recovery. So if I can perform more volume of training and recover from it, I'm going to get better kind of physiological gains, especially for um, a sport like the Tour de France. Um, it's your ability to sustain a higher training volume, or even in some cases in the Tour de France to sustain the races and recover from it. Um, is a huge thing. Yeah, I without question, like pretty much every sport has some kind of doping in it, especially sports with money on them. So, there's Competitive definitely of darts is a big one. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. Well, I mean, alcohol. alcohol. No, you downing, a, downing a pint before you uh, yeah, have a match. Walkers, um, they're used within things like. Uh, uh, with well, form of pressure, chess. chess, possibly. I don't know if there's any kind of beta blockers in chess, but within like pilots use beta blockers. Um, like, sure, sure. Some uh, some musicians, like classical musicians, use beta blockers. Um, you, you, I mean, you'd probably be surprised if there's um, hundreds of thousands of pounds for winning a tournament. Kind of increases the motivation to to bend the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so that kind of leads us neatly on to um, a great article by Brian Crown called uh, Price of the Platform, which was published on Elite FTS. Um, and this is kind of, it's, it's quite a sad article, really, when you, when you read the stories behind it. So just to explain why, um, this article is about competitive powerlifting and how years of competitive powerlifting at the highest level can take its toll on um, not just your, your body, but uh, your family life, your, your finances. Um, and it has some real um, stories. Obviously, the names have been changed, but, um, you know, guys who are addicted to painkillers, um, who, you know, can't get out of bed in the morning without pain, um, guys who, you know, set um, elite totals consistently, broken records, but now can you know can barely walk because they've got degenerative hips and bulging discs and it's I thought it was a really poignant article um, and I know you found it quite interesting as well. 
Yeah, extremely interesting. I think, I just have to talk about the likes of CrossFit, sprinting, weightlifting, and then coming to powerlifting, where guys will do probably um, abuse much um, higher levels of drugs, have absolutely no professional help to do the things they're doing. So they don't have a doctor to make sure that they're doing it properly. Um, they don't have like an experienced person other than another guy who's done it in the past um, advising them or like our an internet forum and advising them in forms of doses or whatever. Um, so guys are like probably super dosing these things, um, doing the old up the dose and lifting the most kind of <laughs> routine. Um, and being the nature of it is, it, it just increases your ability to lift week on, week out. Um, and the, the muscles will remodel, but tendons and ligaments don't remodel quite so fast. That's kind of a longer process. They need to be exposed to the load a while. So if you're lifting within your capabilities, so if you're taking a natural trajectory where you're not putting on 100 pounds or 50 kilos of weight on the bar in the space of like three or four weeks, likelihood is that um, your bicep tendons, pec tendons, all of those will kind of follow your your strength trajectory they'll be able to handle those loads whereas if, especially in strongman but also in like uh untested powerlifting um things like torn pecs torn biceps are fairly big um muscle injury mechanisms and uh, strongman is ridiculous for it uh, i can't remember off the top of my head but something like um six percent of all injuries in strongman are acute and the bicep makes up something like 20 or 30 percent of those kind of ruptures. Whereas if you look at um, weightlifting or powerlifting, in powerlifting, acute injury makes up probably five percent of injuries. In weightlifting, it probably makes up 10 percent of injuries. Uh, you think of a dynamic sport, weightlifting is probably about as dynamic as it gets, um, as we're, as as in terms of loads and distance moved. Nothing in strength training um, compares to like the full snatch, as regards like speed and range of mo- movement. Um, and probably within strongman, due to like a lot of it's to do with the different angles and whatnot. It's a very like kind of bicep heavy sport. There's a lot of moving in, in it, so calves take a pound in. But, like a lot of the stuff is to do with just the actual strength of the guy and his tendons, whereas his chest or his bicep can generate so much force. Um, but his kind of supporting structures, his tendons and his ligaments can't actually deal with the force, so eventually they just rupture. Um, so like there tends to be like a huge pathology within unnatural strength athletes as regards um, injury and thus painkillers become like a huge kind of thing because they allow you to train and do whatever. And this article is basically talking about these guys' experiences of getting addicted to painkillers um like affecting their health just so they can train in a sport what ultimately no one cares about. <laughs> uh, I think yeah. is the, the kind of guy that does that is um, that's a special kind of guy. Yeah, and <clears throat> I mean, I, I do have respect for the achievements. I guess it's you know it's incredible the post elite totals. You know, never mind for ten years or twenty years. Um, but you're right when you when you're sacrificing all of this stuff for. Uh, for really no gain at all, you know, no recognition, um, you know, maybe a plastic trophy, um, you don't get any sort of medical <laughs> out of it. Um, it's, there's no safety net, of course. Um, and just, you know, one of the stories in this article was, um, was a guy called Eddie who quit his $50,000 a year job for, uh, working in a grocery store just so that he could concentrate more on his lifting. Um, yeah, and he was spending money on a reverse hyper machine when his wife was freaking out about bills. Um, and, you know, that really, that really puts it in perspective that it's not, it's not healthy to have that level of, uh, imbalance in your, in your life. Uh, no, nah. uh, like quite a lot of the stuff was, um, like socially related. Like they would damage their relationships with their wife and kids, um, because they spent so much time at the gym. Um, they go into debt to afford drugs, equipment, whatever else. Um, it's kind of I, I, anyone that knows me will know I'm not a, a fan of quit powerlifting. Um, like one of the biggest things with quit powerlifting for me anyway is it kind of puts a money barrier into a sport that should cost a gym membership. Uh, that's literally what it should cost to be a powerlifter. 
just to have access to some weights, and then you can do it. Um, I, I just like that kind of aspect of the sport where anyone with a barbell can do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think I, I think that's why CrossFit has done so well and why powerlifting's kind of shot itself in the foot because, like you say, powerlifting on paper is one of the most successful sports you could imagine. Um, you know, even CrossFit is kind of more difficult to get into in terms of, you know, the sheer variety of movements you have to perform. If you if you want to do powerlifting, you just have to be able to do a bench, deadlift, and a squat. Or, you know, in some cases, you don't even have to do all three of those movements. In some cases, so, you don't even have to squat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just kind of uh, do a curtsy. Just, just yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just get... Some, you know, in some cases you just have to be able to step into a multiply suit and then it does it the rest for you, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think somehow it's gone tragically wrong if a sport which literally is so easy to get into has become a niche with, you know, extremely high barriers to participation, you know, especially the multiply lifting, you know, the equip lifting where the, you know, the ordinary person just can't even get on the, the level required to, to make that um, accessible, I think the sort of the sort of personality, the sort of person that ends up um, using performance enhancing drugs to take part in strongman, powerlifting, weightlifting, or um, CrossFit or whatever, um, sports where let's face it, you're not going to make a living, and um, want to put their body through that just so they can take part in that sport. I, I have um, trouble believing that those are kind of well-adjusted personalities. To be honest, I know a few. Um, I can say they're a special kind of people. Very special kind of people. <laughs> God bless them. God bless them all. Um, like, at the end of the day, like, it is what it is. You know, you don't affect anyone but yourself unless you end up shooting up a mall or something. But um, yeah, outside of any kind of um, psychological maladjustment, like you're only hurting yourself really. So. Yeah, it, it's your own choice. So if you want to do it, fine, whatever, man. I'm not gonna make a judgment call on that, but it really does take a special kind of person to want to spend money to be good at something that no one cares about, and not just spend money to be good at it, but also maybe take twenty years off your life and worsen your your um, worsen your uh, standard quality of, living. of life. Yeah, yeah, exactly, standard of living, quality of life, man. just so you could bench more, squat more, deadlift more. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe, maybe your kids didn't go to college, but you hit that elite total, so hey, that's all that matters. Well, good, man. You you squatted 2,000 pounds in a multiplier suit in a federation that would have given it to you anyway if you didn't go to depth. And, you know, you're you're the champ of that federation with three people in it, but well done. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, really good article, very well written. Um, definitely worth a read. It's on the Elite FTS website. Well, again, I said we'll put a link in the in the notes. Okay. Um, so I think that pretty much wraps up that this uh, episode. Apart from shoutouts. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a couple of shoutouts. JC Dean um, just posted a fantastic article on fat loss. Um, I really the reason I, I mean I've got on with JC for a long time and I've really liked his stuff. Um, for a long time as well. But the reason this article spoke to me is because it's written for people who just need some actionable information. And 99% of stuff in fitness out there is really not actionable. It's kind of overcomplicated. Um, it doesn't really give people the help they need. And it's the, the article is called How to Lose Weight, The Best Way to Lose Fat and Avoid Fad Diets. So um, shout out to JC there. Also um, shout out to everyone doing the um, ALS or here in the UK, the MND Ice Bucket Challenge, um, that cause is quite close to my heart. So I kind of, it was really nice to see people taking part of that. Uh, yeah, so that's that's me done anyway. We're up. Um, I'm planning on doing that tomorrow, but it might not happen. We'll see. I was going to nominate you, actually. So. I've actually been nominated like four times. So <laughs> I kind of need to get my ass in gear and do it. Um, and the guys at work did it yesterday. Um, and I... Um, happened to disappear <laughs> opportunely. Just do it for fat loss. That 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 day uh, called thermogenesis. Oh, fuck the brown adipose tissue. You just want to drink that there uh, ice water just to get them negative calories, bro. Yeah. 
<laughs> some energetic effect of feeling up in this bitch. Um, I like to give one shout out to my man Dan Carlin, who does uh, the Hardcore History podcast. Um, yeah, Dan Carlin's stuff's amazing. Um, he recently released. Uh, he's currently doing a a series on the First World War, um, which he's called Blueprint for Armageddon. He's on part four. He's just covered the Battle of the Somme um, and Battle of Jutland and what was that French battle? You remember? Uh, Verdun. Yeah, Verdun. Verdun. Yeah, well, actually, Verdun was that Belgium or? Hmm. Uh, it was Belgium, France. Yeah, I think it was France. Um, but yeah, so like, great. Like, guys um, spends a long ass time researching, as anyone who waits for his podcasts um, will attest to, because it normally takes them about three months to come out with one. Um, but yeah, he researches them um, brilliantly, but it's not necessarily his research, it's more his delivery um, that's worth listening to. He kind of puts more of a personal touch on these things um, than you might get from like reading, reading Wikipedia or listening to some of our podcasts. He doesn't just go over facts and figures, he get, trying to get. He looks at the human experience of these things, so it's fascinating hearing him going through the human experience of things like the Mongol invasions or um, the, the Roman Republic or the fall of the Roman Republic, rise and fall. Um, he's done stuff on... Uh, what else he's done? Uh, he did he did, a, he did like a case study um, during the wars of religion in Europe. Um, yeah. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Uh, totally worth a listen. If you haven't listened to it, definitely go listen to it. Yeah, I, I started listening to that after you um, you posted a link, and I, I went through all of the First World War ones that he has up, and then I went on to the Genghis Khan yeah. uh, podcast. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, really, really top-notch. Uh, Genghis Khan was awesome. Um, my personal favorite is called... Oh, shit, what's it called? Uh, Prophets, Prophets of Doom is my favorite one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was about to listen to that, actually. Yeah, so. <laughs> do it. Um, it's like a three-hour podcast. It's brilliant. I uh, got like a four-hour podcast, which basically goes over the dark ages, dark ages in Europe, um, called shit, man. Uh, I can't remember, but yeah, um, he also does like a political podcast called Common Sense, which kind of focuses on um, uh, American politics, but he takes a very practical kind of look at things, and certainly a different sort of spin you'd have from most kind of political outlooks. So definitely worth worth a look if you haven't heard of him before. That's Dan Carlin, my nigga. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, he's awesome. Um, yeah, I don't really have any other shoutouts apart from that. Um, no, I'm good. Yeah, sweet. Um, yeah, so we would read. This is where we would read comments. If you would leave comments, um, yeah, but no one's listening to this, so it doesn't matter. So, yeah, um, so no one's actually left any comments under episode six, which. You know, it's been there for about six weeks, seven weeks. Yeah, but you know what? I, we don't need you. Don't yeah, need you guys no, anyway. No, fuck you. Um, you said if you're listening, well, why aren't you commenting, bruh? What's wrong? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it'd be nice if maybe drops a comment. I remember when you used to comment. Yeah, those were the days. Harrison didn't even comment in the last one. I mean, come on, man. Yeah. Well, you know, screw those guys. Yeah, the, 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 there's a number one fan slot up for grabs. For anyone who wants to put the first comment on the next podcast post, I'll, I'll accept first. That'll do. <laughs> I'm not fussy. Um, so yeah, that concludes episode seven of the Health and Fitness podcast. I've been Mark. And I've been Ben. And hopefully, here, <laughs> see you next week. As long <laughs> as I press the record button. See ya.